Welcome back, everyone. For today's video, we are going to be taking a look at a game that was played in the Grenka Chess Classic being held in Karlsruhe, Germany. Now, the five-time world chess champion, Magnus Carlsen, dropped out of the cycle. He did not defend his title in the last world championship match, and Ding Loren emerged victorious against Jan Nepomneshi from Russia. Now, today, Magnus and Ding are playing for the first time in regular chess. It's not classical chess. It is rapid, of course, but the only time that they've played since Ding became the world champion was in, in the freestyle goat chess challenge which was held in germany back at the beginning of march or i guess end of february to be more precise at any rate both players are playing regular chess let's see what happens so magnus has the white pieces yesterday he started with two black black games today he will have two white games so magnus opens with d4 we get knight to f6 from ding we get c4 being played e6 knight to f3 and now ding plays d5 here magnus decides to trade the pawns on d5 white could of course play knight c3 bishop f4 or bishop g5 but when white decides to trade the pawns on d5 right away the structure becomes fixed immediately and you never really have to worry about this pawn on c4 say you play knight c3 for example black could always capture this pawn black could go here for example or here and you always have to figure out do you want to trade the pawn or do you want to let it be captured and that decision sometimes can cost you a lot of time especially in a rapid game so after we get takes takes here magnus goes knight c3 ding plays move c6 and now we have the move bishop f4 after bishop to f4 is played ding goes bishop to f5 trying to develop his own light square bishop on this diagonal if black were to play a move like bishop e7 for example white can try to play his move queen c2 taking control of this diagonal with the queen and then down the road even playing something like bishop to d3 and here white has this great diagonal with both the bishop and the queen spying towards his pawn next to the black king so we got bishop f5 from ding magnus plays e3 now we have the move knight b to d7 knight to h4 is played and now we have bishop to e4 here magnus plays the move f3 and ding goes back to g6 now first glance you're probably thinking why is white moving the knight to the rim the reason is that this diagonal is very very critical for both sides in terms of their future development if black were to go bishop e6 and white gets this bishop d3 move with queen c2 down the road this diagonal is going to play quite a bit of havoc for the player with the black pieces so that's why Ding plays bishop e4 we get f3 bishop g6 and now Magnus plays this move g4 taking some space on the king side additionally when Magnus plays g4 here this restricts the light square bishop there's no squares available these pawns dominate or suffocate the bishop and down the road Magnus intends to trade the knight for the bishop but he's just taking space before he is forced to capture on g6 so we get bishop to e7 magnus now trades the knight for the bishop he goes queen c2 and magnus intends to castle his king to the queen side here and then maybe push e4 or even g5 but using these pawns in the center of the board ding goes knight to f8 here magnus castles and now ding plays the move knight e6 magnus obviously retreats the bishop because you don't want to give up this bishop say you go king b1 and we get takes takes now you have these double pawns on top of each other and you also no longer have the two b's so we get bishop to g3 magnus trying to keep the bishop pair or what i like to affectionately call the two b's on the board where he's the two b's versus a bishop and a knight after bishop g3 ding plays the move bishop to d6 magnus goes bishop to e1 we have queen c7 and now let's move king to b1 is played in this position here ding decides the castle he does not go down the route of the famous former world chess champion robert james fisher by trying to capture this pawn on h2 after takes takes here white is actually doing very well because you can play g5 if you move the knight away there's f4 and suddenly this bishop is trapped behind enemy lines with this walled pawn a sample line would be bishop to g1 bishop to d2 let's just say black castles here and now after bishop to h3 this bishop is in really really bad shape let's just say you go back to h2 I th i'm not sure if white can actually trap the bishop but at the very least white can even take here take the pawn on g6 and this bishop is still completely out of play these pawns prevent the bishop from going back to familiar territory and white will probably go on to win the game so that's why ding decides here to castle out of the center of the board we now get h4 being played here by magnus trying to take some space maybe intending to play g5 down the road but in general just making sure that he, this pawn is protected on h4 ding goes king b8 now we get rook to g1 here ding plays a6 and now magnus goes for rook g2 now this is a very creative idea from magnus what he wants to do here is he wants to play something like queen to b3 and after let's just say i wait rook d8 he wants to go rook c2 rook c1 and suddenly here after knight to a4 white has the double stack pressuring this pawn on c6 both of the bishops are aiming towards the queen side here both of these diagonals 
and the queen is aiming towards the king on b8 as well so all of white's pieces here are on perfect squares white has achieved perfect harmony and white probably will go on to win the game in short order so that's why after rook g2 ding goes g5 here magnus plays h5 and ding now plays c5 now ding of course feeling a little bit desperate here trying to create some activity because he already sees what's happening with the queen move the rook swing and all this pressure towards his king on b8 so ding goes c5 trying to strike in the center of the board and go after white's central pawns here on e3 and d4 and now magnus takes on c5 ding captures with the bishop and magnus plays knight to a4 here ding plays the move bishop takes e3 which is actually the best move in the position computer here thought that maybe rook d3 is playable but after d4 black is getting rid of the central pawn and after pawn takes let's say i take with the rook there's also this nice square for the knight on f4 here where it's supported by this pawn on g5 and magnus simply wasn't interested so we get knight to a4 ding takes the pawn on e3 we get queen b3 and it looks really really scary here because even though white is sacrificed a pawn again white is spying this pawn on b7 and the king on b8 the bishop can capture on a6 and you can also swing the rook to c2 to hit the queen so ding plays d4 here supporting his bishop on e3 and now magnus plays rook c2 now if magnus were to play this move bishop takes a6 you're probably thinking why didn't he capture the reason that magnus probably didn't capture is that now after this move rook to c8 black has his own threat here let's just say you play a move like queen b6 for example with queen c1 sacking the queen and after rook takes queen rook takes rook suddenly the white king on b1 is simply checkmated king has no squares available this is what we refer to as the classic ice skater checkmate so after d4 magnus instead decides to play the move rook to c2 we get queen to d6 here and now magnus plays bishop a5 trying to use this bishop via the a5 d8 diagonal now at first glance i would hate to have this position with the black pieces because it really does look like all of white's pieces are pretty much perfectly placed with the exception of the rook on d1 if white could put this rook on c1 here white would be doing very well but the black wooden shield on e3 really prevents that pawn supports the bishop bishop covers a square but nonetheless this rook this queen this knight and both of the two b's look like they're very very well placed and so you'd feel like white should have a very serious attack so in this position after bishop to a5 we get the move queen to d5 played by ding and this is a move that i really really like here ding is feeling the pressure he's not sure what's going on and one of the ways to try and reduce your opponent's attacking chances is by trading queens off the board now don't forget the ding has already won one pawn magnus sacked this pawn on e3 earlier so when ding plays queen d5 here he is sacrificing the rook on d8 but he has a bishop and a pawn in return for this passive rook on d1 so after queen d5 magnus captures the rook we get queen takes queen pawn takes queen and now rook takes bishop and again ding here has a bishop and a pawn for the rook on d1 here but on top of that this rook is very very passive one thing that you'll no notice about end games is that rooks are best placed on open files like this rook on c2 is on an open file if white could magically say get some position like i'm just gonna put the knight on f8 here or you can get this rook to c7 suddenly the rooks are coordinated very well on c2 and c7 there's pressure on b7 and pressure on the f7 pawn as well so rooks are on an open file rooks always function best when they're on open files or open lanes as the famous valorant streamer Tarek would call them but in this position the rook on d1 is not a good piece the pawn and the bishop are very well very well placed white cannot use the open file and even if you could magically get some position like this with the rook on h1 this idea of h6 is extremely slow here and not really relevant also black could even go d3 forking the rook and the bishop so because magnus is very passive rook on d1 and black is this great bishop on e3 supported by the pawn in conjunction with this great square on f4 for one of d's knights it feels like ding is doing okay so magnus plays the move knight to c5 here ding goes knight to d5 and now we get bishop to d3 knight d5 very logical move ding is more than happy to trade here because if we look at this position let's just say we get this position for example you'll notice that white does not have any major targets this bishop is, is staring at an open diagonal this way there is pressure on the pawn of b7 but black has a great bishop stops rook c1 great knight which also supports the pawn thrust with d3 and it really just doesn't feel like white has a whole lot of play here now of course you'll look at the eval bar and see that white is better because there is a rook c5 move here but the general theme is very important as you look at the position so after knight to d5 
Magnus plays the move bishop to d3. Ding plays knight to b4 here. And bishop d3 is kind of the start of where it's really starting to go out the window. Computer wants knight to d3 here, trying to blockade this pawn. I frankly don't understand why the computer gives white an advantage here after a simple move like f6 or a move like a5. But it says that this is the best move. But again, not a move that I think is super critical. And frankly, I don't really even understand what the computer wants but obviously at the end of the day it's 3800 i'm a very puny 2800 so it does no better than i do nonetheless magnus plays bishop d3 we get knight to b4 we get knight takes knight pawn takes knight and now the move rook c5 now it's starting to look like magnus may get some chance to win the game here because if black were to play with like king a7 there's rook to e5 hitting the pawn on e6 or even rook to c7 hitting these pawns on b7 and g7 and when you combine that with an idea like bishop to e4 suddenly white is very close to winning the game so after rook to c5, Ding plays the move rook to d5 here, trying to trade off the rooks. And once again, Ding is assuming that with his great bishop on e3, he should be very much in the game. Now, this is actually a little bit of a mistake, according to the computer. It wants to move bishop to f4, which, when you understand the idea, is suddenly very obvious. But of course, over the board, not straightforward. What bishop f4 does is the bishop supports the pawn. It also stops rook to c1. But on top of that, it stops white from putting this rook on e5. And down the road, let's just say you go king a1, Black can even go e5 here, and the bishop supports both pawns. It also covers the c1 square, and the pawn on e5 supports his pass pawn on d4, so Black is doing quite well. But in a rapid human game, obviously not, not straightforward, so we get to move rook to d5. Here, Magnus plays the strange move rook to c4. Now, the computer actually wants rook takes rook, and it gives white a little bit of an advantage if black were to take with the pawn which i think is what most likely would happen here magnus was probably worried that in this position the knight can never be removed from b4 so let's say you set up some position like this how do you remove this knight from b4 you just simply cannot remove the knight king cannot get forward rook can't get forward rook can't get to c1 the only try would be something like rook to h1 but suddenly after d3 here you could actually very easily lose the game let's say rook d1 and d2 here rook h1 and d4 and this knight is anchored by the pawn it restricts the white king from getting into the game and then you have this pass pawn on d2 which is one square away from queening and i want to say that black can even just eventually run the king all the way down and probably win the game but the computer actually says that after bishop to f5 and a5 here white can play a strange move rook to e1 and the reason this is actually still good for white is that now d3 is no longer possible you would hang the bishop on the game and when you play king c7 white can sack a pawn with this move f4 if black were to take with the bishop there's rook to e7 creating the kebab after king d6 rook g7 and d3 white can go h6 d2 and bishop c2 stopping the pawn and white will just go h7 rook g8 and h8 and win the game in short order sample line bishop e5 rook g8 let's just say d4 h7 d3 bishop d1 here and white is simply going to win after knight d5 you can you can even just queen probably not the only way but after takes takes knight e3 and rook to h2 takes takes knight e3 rook d3 white has a rook versus knight and it should be winning again very fast sample line not super relevant but the point is if white can get the h pawn rolling white will win the game after rook to e1 king c7 f4 black were to take with the pawn now white can go g5 trying to push p and create a pass pawn on the h file and after f3 h6 takes and g6 now black has to go knight c6 to get back in time but after g7 knight to e7 and a move like king c2 king d6 and bishop to h7 white probably should be winning here the game goes on after f2 rook h1 and h5 but realistically even though black has all these um let's just say king e6 queen takes takes king d6 and king e2 h4 black has a bunch of pawns here you've got the three white peoples that are split but this position i think from a technical standpoint should be close to winning for white computer doesn't say it's over but i do think in a human game white would win this quite easily instead magnus goes rook to c4 here and now ding obviously plays a5 supporting and anchoring this knight on b4 and now black has the ideal setup with the permanent bastion on b4 magnus plays the move bishop to e4 here and now we get the move rook to d6 and magnus goes rook c5 now once again magnus could have sacked a pawn with f4 here to try and create counterplay this one is a lot less clear though because with rooks on the board after pawn takes g5 and f3 if white goes to h6 here takes and g6 black not take sorry g6 um black can simply go rook to d8 here stopping the pawn from queening and with this wooden shield on e3 still in place black might even have chances to win the game 
For that reason, Magnus now goes rook c5. We get b6. He goes rook c4 back. Ding plays e5. And now we get this move, rook takes b4. Now, oddly enough, in this position, rook takes b4 is considered to be the best move, sacking the rook, because white's position is simply impossible to play without the sacrifice. Black's rook on d6 stops the idea with h6. Say you get rook h1, for example, and I play a waiting move like rook f6. You cannot go h6 because I will take the pawn. So this idea with rook h1 doesn't work. So how then do you activate the rook? You can't go to c1. The pawn support the bishop. The knight is anchored by the pawn on a5. So white simply has nothing he can do here. And that's why Magnus sacrificed the rook for the knight, effectively offering a draw in this position. Because after pawn takes rook and king c2, we're in a situation with opposite color b's here. And sooner or later, the rooks will probably get traded. Here, Ding plays the move d3, and this is a very nice practical decision to try and force the game to end in a draw. If you were to play a move like rook d7 after rook a1, rook to a7, this probably is still a draw after takes and king d3, but there are some nuances here, because if you were to get careless and play king a6 and king a7, white can now, now sneak the king into f7 and g7 and win the game. Bishop here prevents black from pushing the pawn forward, and white will just go for this pawn and just push P and win the game in short order. So there are some tricks here, and you would have to be a little bit careful. And against a great endgame swindler, on top of being a great endgame player, Magnus Carlsen is the one guy you don't want to be in this situation against. So for that reason, Ding plays D3, Magnus takes. Ding, of course, swaps the rooks, and now he goes bishop c1. We get king to c4, and Ding plays king c7. And Ding here no longer is worried, because what he knows is that when Magnus goes king d5, he now plays king to d7. He does not take this pawn on b2, because after king e6, king f7 captures with the pawn push, white would simply win the game. So Ding decides to play the move king to d7 here. Magnus has to capture, because he doesn't have a straight path to get to f7. But now after king to e7 here, another very precise move, by the way, King f5 and bishop to d2 here. Ding ignores everything on the queen side because the king can support this pawn from f8 and the bishop can always support both the pawns from d2. And now the game is simply drawn. Magnus continues with king g6. We get king to f8, bishop to d5, bishop c1, bishop c4, and again bishop d2. Ding does not take the pawn on b2 because now after king takes g5, white probably has great chance to win the game with these three connected pawns that he can start pushing up the board. Probably it's still a draw of perfect play, but there's no reason to allow this whatsoever. So Ding decides to wait with bishop d2. Magnus plays bishop d5, bishop c1, and after bishop c4 and bishop to d2, the game ends in a draw. Now, this was a very interesting game played between the two players. It felt like Magnus was pressing out of the opening. Ding was a little bit worse, but Ding found some really, really good concepts. The central break with c5, sacking the rook for the bishop in the pawn was very, very critical as well. And Ding showed some true resilience in a major test against Magnus. Now, keep in mind, when they played in the Fischer Random event in Germany back at the, I believe, end of February, if I'm not mistaken, Ding got absolutely crushed in that game. So for Ding to come back today in a game where he was under some pressure with the black piece against Magnus and Rapid and draw is definitely going to be a big boost for his confidence as he moves forward into other terms, but also as he moves towards the World Chess Championship match where he will defend his title in November of this year. So... Exciting game played between the two players. It ends in a draw, but there were definitely some chances for Magnus, but Ding shows why he is currently the world champion and why we look forward to so many future matches between these two players. Now, before we go, there is one other thing that I want to point out as well for those of you guys who, who are watching this video. We do have our merch store where you can buy some of the Hikaru swag for the cans. We've got a glossy mug. We've got a unisex hoodie, uh, a men's classic tee, as well as a tee for women as well. You can type Exclam merch uh, on my Twitch chat or my Kick chat. Also, we will have a link with the description in the, below in the video so you can go to the merch store and order these items if you're so enthused because of course we have the cans tournament which is coming up in about one week from now so hope you guys enjoyed the video hope you guys ordered some merch as we moved into the candidates tournament which will be starting in a week but on, on at any note i would like to point out once again that if you guys are not subscribed to my channel make sure that you smash that subscribe button below and we'll be back with some more great recaps from the grenka chess classic and karlsruhe germany as well as what everybody is really waiting for which are the daily recaps when i compete in the canada chess tournament in toronto starting on april 4th hope you guys enjoyed it have a great rest of your day see you bye